I accept your nomination to be president of the United States of America. This morning, Democrats fresh off their national convention, but will the enthusiasm in Chicago translate to Texas? State Rep Ron Reynolds excoriated by fellow Democrats for being the first to call on Harris to replace Biden. Now, though, he's feeling some vindication after the party followed his prediction. A new poll shows the presidential race could be a close one in Texas. Kamala Harris closing in on Donald Trump and Colin Allred only behind Ted Cruz by a couple of points. And do Texas Republicans adjust their election strategy with this new surge in Democratic energy? Travis County GOP Chair and Republican strategist Matt Makoviak on the GOP perspective from Chicago and the 15 counties he says that will decide the next president. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good Sunday morning from Chicago. I'm Jason Whiteley. Texas Democrats heading home this weekend after the Democratic National Convention. But we begin our program, as always, with the top political headlines happening in Texas. And two new Texas surveys to show you. The first, Donald Trump versus Kamala Harris in the Lone Star State. Harris now closing in on Trump. She is five points behind him. And this is significant because Biden was originally 10 points back. And then the biggest race in the state this November for U.S. Senate. Colin Allred now two points behind Ted Cruz. This race, according to this survey, now within the margin of error. The University of Houston's Hobby School of Public Affairs and Texas State University did this poll. Texas women were front and center over the past few days here in Chicago, sharing their personal stories about losing access to abortion. Kate Cox addressed the DNC. She is the Texas woman who had to leave the state for an abortion after doctors determined that her pregnancy was not viable. Cox spoke along with Amanda Zorowski, who had a similar experience, and Cecile Richards, the daughter of the late Governor Ann Richards and the former director of Planned Parenthood, also in Chicago. And a Republican from Waco is leaving the Texas legislature earlier than expected. State Rep Doc Anderson was not running for re-election in November, but the 79-year-old lawmaker has decided to resign immediately. Doing so is going to give his successor more seniority by just a couple of months. Anderson has served in the House for 20 years. Our first guest this morning is a Texas Democrat who is feeling some vindication right now. Right after the disastrous Biden debate with Donald Trump back in June, State Rep Ron Reynolds got on Instagram and he said that Joe Biden needs to drop out. He said that Kamala Harris should take over the ticket. Now, Reynolds said this long before Congressman Lloyd Doggett and others went public, but Democrats excoriated Reynolds for doing so. In the end, history has proven Reynolds right. He is the chairman of the Texas Legislative Black Caucus, and he represents parts of Houston, Missouri City, and Stafford. Representative, welcome to the program here. First time you and I spoke, uh, most recently, it was right after the presidential debate, and you were one of the rare Democrats that came out and said, we've got to replace Joe Biden on the ballot. You were excoriated for that position. I was. In fact, I was told that I would be primaried. I was a dino, a Democrat in name only. I Democrats was, told you all this? Yes, that I should uh, be stripped of my delegate status, that I should not show up at the convention, that uh, I was not loyal to the party and the president. That, that's what I was told. What's your reaction now? Well, I, I think that the proof is in the pudding. We see record fundraising, we see record enthusiasm, uh, there's optimism, there's energy, it's electrifying. So I feel validated, I feel vindicated. I feel a lot of those same people, they didn't say, hey, I'm sorry, but they did say, I'm glad that she's the nominee. People are so happy and joyous. We've seen long lines to get into the United Center. We've seen people on waiting lists for delegate for, for credentials to get into the United Center. That didn't happen when President Biden was the our official nominee. There was a lack of enthusiasm. There was a almost certainty that we were going to lose to former President Trump. The challenge for Democrats is going to be taking this energy and enthusiasm in Chicago and taking it back to Texas to try to get the vote out. How challenging is that going to be because your constituents Majority Texans aren't in Chicago. They aren't seeing this. They aren't feeling this and aren't experiencing this. You're absolutely right. That's the job of the delegates, elected officials, and our precinct chairs, and Democrat enthusiasts, is to take that message back 
to the masses, to the low propensity voters, to people who are working their jobs and just trying to pay their bills, make it ends meet, that aren't even thinking about the election. I, it's not gonna be easy. I'm not gonna sit here and lie and say, oh yes, we're about to turn Texas blue. But I do think that it's plausible it, the demographics are there. There are more African-Americans in Texas than any other state. Kamala Harris is an X factor that I think is gonna be very pivotal in helping flip some seats that we need in the Texas House. One of the things I've noticed is that Democrats love the energy and enthusiasm that, that's going on right now inside the party, but there are still some Democrats that are running away from Kamala Harris. How's that going to pan out? What does that mean for down ballot races like yours and, and so many others across the state? Well, here's the thing. I, I'm, I, as someone who's chair of the Texas Legislative Black Caucus, I can tell you that our community, the African American community, is fired up. You know, uh, the vice president went to a historically black college and university that's known as HBCU. She's in a sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha. The the the, the the enthusiasm I've seen for those groups is electrifying. And so I do believe that down ballot is going to help those candidates, particularly in the urban centers, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio. I believe that there are going to be Democrat pickup opportunities that we're going to see. I don't know how much it plays out in the rural areas, but I do believe in the urban centers, they're gonna run up the score to give Texas a chance to, to, to turn blue. Now, I'm not saying it's a guarantee, but I do believe that Texas is in play. Texas is one of the states. You, that think, the, you think Texas is in play? They're, they're, Texas is one of the states, it's not in the first tier where you're talking about Arizona and- Not a battleground. Know, no, not a battleground, but it's in the second tier. When I'm talking to the party activists, I've talked to DNC chair, Jamie Harrison. What are they saying? Te they're saying, yes, we're looking at Texas. So they're, they're not saying, yes, we need Texas to win, but they see Texas as an opportunity, particularly with the Senate and the balance of power being so close. They are putting enormous resources in Colin Albert's race for U.S. Senate. Are there any pitfalls in the road ahead for Kamala Harris over the next two and a half months? Well, she, th this is gonna be a very tough race. I think there's still some people, quite candidly speaking, that are very concerned that a woman can be the president. I think that we're ready to break that glass ceiling. There are others who are saying maybe she has a double negative because she's an African-American Indian and female. I think that we're gonna have to break that cycle. And so that's a challenge that she's gonna have to overcome. And I hope that the American people are ready to embrace that diversity, uh, gender and ethnic. I think we, you know, Obama, he broke glass ceilings in, in, in terms of the race. And I think it's far time, we've seen Shirley Chisholm, we've seen Geraldine Ferraro, and we've seen Hillary Clinton. I think this, the, let's say the fourth time's a charm. Representative, thank you for the time. Thank you. You know, Democrats are rarely as united as Republicans, especially in Texas. But the one question that I've been asking Texas Democrats here at the Democratic National Convention, what can they do with all this energy and enthusiasm in this city? Will it translate back to Texas? And that's a conversation I had with State Senator Royce West, a Democrat who represents Dallas. In, in, in terms of Texas, let's talk Texas for a second. The question is, is how do we leave, how do the delegates here in Texas leave here? You know, we'll be pumped up. We'll be, as we have been in other conventions. The question is, how will that look on the ground once we get back? Can it translate? I think it will translate. And, 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 and in part, it goes back to the question you just asked about Kamala Harris. Uh, that people are excited about her in Texas, too. And, and then the suburban women in Texas, and you, you, you can help me with this, Jason. Uh, how do they feel about abortion? How, how, how are suburban women feeling about abortion in Texas? Are they okay with the laws as they are? Or do they want their rights back? Do they want their freedom back? And if they want their freedom back, you can be assured that they're gonna be voting Democratic. The debate on September the 10th is gonna be very uh, important, where Trump has been uh, personalizing this, calling her names, uh, and what, she, what did she say? Say it to my face. Okay, you gotta make sure you understand. She, it was very diplomatic the way she said it, but you gotta make sure you understand what the intent was behind it. Say it to my face. And it's gonna be interesting whether or not he's, he's gonna be able to say it to her face, all of the stuff he's been saying. When we come back this morning, we'll talk to a Republican about what November now looks like after the Democratic National Convention. Matt Makoviak, chairman of the Travis County Republican Party is up next with us. Inside Texas Politics, back from Chicago in just a moment.
Welcome back to Inside Texas Politics. Our next guest this morning says that the presidential race is going to be decided by 15 counties in this country. Counties, not states. Matt McCoviak chairs the Travis County Republican Party, and we wanted to know whether Texas Republicans now change anything about their November election strategy after what they saw Democrats do here in Chicago. Matt, welcome back to the program here. Uh, I want to ask you about what things look like immediately after the Democratic National Convention. Obviously, Kamala Harris, Tim Walls will get a convention boost like Donald Trump did after Milwaukee. What do Republicans do differently now, if anything, in Texas? Yeah, look, I think uh, the, the question now is, um, is has, has Harris's kind of free ride come to an end? Is the rise that she's had over six weeks, which has been meteoric, um, is that now going to be sustained by anything that's real? Um, this race now, as we get closer to Labor Day, really becomes about issues um, and it becomes about the things that matter most to voters. Uh, the Democrats did a good job of introducing her of having this unprecedented switch of pulling off a convention that attracted a large TV audience of having some impressive performances. I think the challenge the Dems have now is two things. One, uh, if she has so many good ideas about how to make things better, why hasn't they been doing that for three years? But but two is, you know, what are her policy ideas going to be? Why has her opinion changed on so many things? Uh, and when is she going to start answering actual questions? She's gone something like 30 days without receiving one adversarial question from a member of the media. So uh, for, for the Trump team, uh, they need to make this race about the economy and about immigration. And if they do that, they're going to win. Uh, if this is about personalities, it's about looking backwards. If it's about abortion, then Harris has a chance to win. And I think the stakes almost have never been higher in a national election at any time in my life. Well, what do you expect this to look like, a, a race on personalities or a, a race on policy? Yeah, I mean, the Dems are trying to make it about personality. You know, they, they, they're running on, on joy, whatever that means. Um, I don't think a lot of Americans are, are feeling joy about the state of the country right now. Um, but that's what that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to make it a personality battle. And look, Donald Trump's strengths and weaknesses, I think, are well understood by 100 percent of the people that live in America. Uh, you know, it's all been baked into the cake. It's all been priced into the stock. It's really not about who you like better. It's really about did you like the Trump presidency better or did you like the Biden Harris administration four year period better? What was better for you? What was better for your family? What made you feel more secure? What made you feel like you have more of an economic opportunity? Uh, and that's, again, the frame that I think Trump has to get back to. And I think as we lead into this televised debate, uh, the stakes are going to be very high for that, too. Can Harris sustain a 90 minute debate and get into substance, explain her position changes and her record and her vision and her policy ideas? Uh, can Trump, uh, you know, make the case against her, but do it in a way that doesn't turn off female voters, which is challenging when you're going up against a female in a televised debate setting. So, um, look, this race is not settled. What has happened is Kamala Harris has, has brought back uh, the Democrats from the abyss with all the uh, leakage that was happening after the, the first debate with Biden. Uh, the, the, we have seven states that are going to determine this thing, Pennsylvania being the largest uh, crown jewel in that whole list. Uh, but I think the debate is really going to make clear what this race is about, what the choice is before the voters. And it's a moment where both of them have to rise to the, to the challenge. What do Texas Republicans make of the Democratic National Convention? Because by, by all you know, measurements here, this has been a huge success for Democrats. I, going back, I can't think of a time in, in the past decade or so that Democrats have been this enthusiastic about anyone. It's 2008 for Barack Obama's the last time. Before that was 1992 for Bill Clinton. Yeah, there are some there are some similarities to the 2008 time frame. Um, and I think for, for, for Democrats, they, they love the idea of having a black female lead their ticket. I think they're also just really enthusiastic about the idea of not having Biden, uh, given how challenging his candidacy had become. Uh, and look, they def desperately want to stop Trump. And it became increasingly clear Biden was uh, unable or incapable of doing that. Uh, but look, they've all been swept up in this uh, six week free ride she's had where she hasn't had to answer questions, hasn't had to detail anything about policy, doesn't even have a policy site on her website. So again, all that's coming to an end. When Labor Day comes around, voters start paying attention. Campaigns start spending real money, debates happen, things change, and the race is going to settle. This is still going to come down to seven states. It's probably going to come down to two or three states. It's probably going to come down to 15 counties in two or three states. And 15, you're talking 15 about 15 counties in a few yep, states? Yeah. Yeah. You're talking about, you know, the urban and the suburban large area, large counties in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan. You could really just start there. Keep in mind, if Trump wins Pennsylvania and Kamala Harris wins Arizona, Nevada, Wisconsin, Michigan. Trump still wins 270, 268. That is how important Pennsylvania is, right? She can flip four battleground states and still come up short. So I think to some extent, Pennsylvania is going to simplify this for all of us. 
If Trump wins Pennsylvania, it's very hard for him to lose. If she wins Pennsylvania, he's going to have to put some of the states together and create other pathways. Before we go and I ask you about the largest race in Texas, Ted Cruz versus Colin Allred, how does this shake out with two months left? Yeah, look, Allred's going to put $100 million into this thing with hard and soft money. Um, and, you know, on paper, I think he has the chance to be an interesting candidate. It really hasn't really come together the way I thought it would. And I think the fact that now Kamala Harris is the nominee, I don't think she's going to close the gap in Texas. I think Trump will win Texas by more than he did in 2020, which was 5.7%. I think he's actually going to expand that. And if that happens, there's no pathway for Allred to win. But look, Cruz is running very hard. He's running very scared. He's working uh, every single minute of the day. His schedule is absolutely insane. Uh, and that race is going to get a lot of attention. It's really the only pickup opportunity the Democrats have in the map in, in, in 2024. And so they are going to put significant resources into Texas. But so far, Allred has not made the sale. He's got to find Trump voters who will vote for Allred. And that's a very difficult task. Matt, good to see you. Thanks, man. Thanks. God bless. The roundtable is ready when we come back here on Inside Texas Politics from Chicago. This is Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley. All right, time now for Reporters Roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. A lot of headlines happening over the last week, especially here in Chicago. I am Mitra is with us from Austin, the Texas Tribune. Bud Kennedy, columnist at the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, and Bernadine Steptoe, of course, political producer at WFAA in Dallas. But let's start with you, the TV audience for the Democratic National Convention here in Chicago. It was huge in Florida. It was huge in Pennsylvania, a major battleground state there, but not Texas. What does this mean to the campaigns in Texas? You know, Texans have their minds made up, and more than 50 percent of Texans have my, made up their mind for Donald Trump. I don't think they were watching. They weren't really interested. Uh, they, they didn't even want to admit to their neighbors that they watched the Democratic convention. You know, it, it just Texas is not fertile ground for watching the Democrats, although probably a few more people watch this year than have in previous years. I, and what do you make of those viewership numbers? Well, it's also looking at how the, you know, how the Democratic committee was holding their convention too. You know, Kamala Harris's campaign has said that they're not really going to focus because of the tight schedule. They're, they're not going to focus and invest in Texas. And so, you know, while we saw a couple of Texans up on stage, they weren't prominent. So there was just definitely a, a disconnect uh, when it came to like how Texas uh, was featured at the convention. Bernadine, on Thursday night, it, it was kind of striking that we saw Colin Allred up there. Of course, you know, the Democrat running for Congress against uh, or running for Senate, rather, against Ted Cruz. It was interesting because he had faced so much questions and criticism over not being seen with Kamala Harris on three recent visits to Texas here. What do you make of, of, of his brief speech up there and the viewership numbers as well? Well, he understands that the momentum is now behind Vice President Harris. And you know what? People in Texas were watching. They might not have been watching in the large numbers like they were in Pennsylvania or other areas, but they were watching. And I think that that's what uh, Alden, the Colin Alden understands, that he does need the support and the momentum that is behind Vice President Harris. And, you know, Bud, the, the poll that came out from the University of Houston and TSU there in Houston shows uh, the, the race tightening for president in the state. It goes back to the similar margin that Trump won by four years ago. Um, but Kamala Harris is gaining ground on Trump. And more importantly, the all red and Cruz race is now within the margin of error. Uh, how much do you think we should stock do you think we should take to these uh, these numbers here well you're you know, we're back to square one we're back where we were before the first debate between donald trump and joe biden uh texas is like it's always been for several cycles now texas is about 50 percent republican about what we used to say 40 percent democrat i now i'd say about 43 percent democrat and about seven percent independent for colin allred to win an election he has to win all 7% of those independents, and he has to get some of those suburban women who are voting Republican. Otherwise, he has to convince them that he's a better choice uh, for, uh, he agrees with them on abortion, and that they should vote for him over Ted Cruz. Texas is still very much a Republican state. We're kind of back to where we were a month and a half ago. And Bernadine, Texas Democrats obviously love to see this poll. They love these numbers. Do you believe them? Yes. But I don't believe that the Democrats are going to win Texas. Now, I don't, that, that's a given. But you do see the polls are tightening because those candidates, the Republican candidates, are not necessarily as well liked. 
But I think that there's sooner or later down the road, you're going to see them even tightening more. But Texas, Texas is still heavily Republican. But you do see that there are some areas of, of growth for Democrats, and they recognize that as well. And I am based on the poll, based on the, the tremendously successful week by all accounts that Democrats had in Chicago. Does this change any election strategy for Texas Republicans? Well, they're going to still kind of hammer home the messages that, that you're, you're hearing, too. They, they still want to talk about the immigration. They still want to hammer the uh, the administration on the economy. They're, they're going to stick with those because those they think those are winning uh, arguments for them. So they'll stick with that plan and, uh, and, and see how it goes. But certainly there's a national kind of wave of interest uh, with the Harris campaign that they're going to have to fight up against. And Bud, final question on that same uh, note there. Can Harris sustain this momentum? Well, women are interested now. Women were not interested in this election before until Kamala Harris ran. A third of women voters, women Democrats, said that they weren't going to vote. Now they are going to vote. Women are more involved. The race is close again. And those independent women as well. And the poll. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the independent women. And, and you know, the, the, the independents do lean conservative in the state. Bud, Bernadine, I, and thanks so much for the input as always. We're back next Sunday to take you inside Texas politics. Hope you can join us then. We'll be back in Texas by then as well. We'll talk to you then. We'll see you next Sunday.